Today is the second Sunday, third Sunday of Lent. We'll be back here again in Denver. And the epistle for this third Sunday of Lent is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 5. Brethren, be ye followers of God as most dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath, believed, and hath delivered himself for us an oblation and a sacrifice to God for an order of sweetness. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not so much as be named among you, as becometh saints, nor obscenity, nor foolish talking, nor scurrility, which is to no purpose, but rather giving of thanks. For know ye this, and understand, that no fornicator, nor unclean nor, nor unclean, nor covetous person, which is a servant of idols, hath any inheritance in the, in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with, with vain words, for because of these things cometh the anger of God upon the children of unbelief. But be ye not therefore partakers with them, for you were heretofore darkness, but now light in the Lord. Walk ye as children of light, for the fruit of the light is in all goodness and justice and truth. And in the Gospel, taking that according to St. Luke, chapter 11. At that time, Jesus was casting out a devil, and the same was dumb. And when he had cast out the devil, the dumb spoke, and the multitudes were in admiration at it. But some of them said, He casts out devils by the elves above the prince of devils. And others, tempting, asked him of him a sign from heaven. But he, seeing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself shall be brought to desolation, and, and, and house upon house shall fall. And if Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because you say that through Beelzebub I cast out devils, now if I cast out devils by Beelzebub, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I by the finger of God cast out devils, doubtless the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man armed keepeth his court, those things which he possesseth are in peace. But if a stronger than he come upon him, and overcome him, he will take away all his armor wherein he trusted, and will distribute his spoils. And he that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through places without water, seeking rest. And not finding, he saith, I will return into my house whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it swept and garnished. <laughs> then he goeth and, and, and taketh with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself. And entering in, they dwell there. And the last state of that man becometh like worse than the first. And it came to pass, as he, as he spoke these words, these, the, these things, that a certain woman from the crowd, lifting up her voice, said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore thee, and the paths that gave thee suck. But he said, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God, and keep it. That's for the words of today's Holy Gospel. Amen. In this third Sunday of Lent, we're in the middle of a great battle. The war has been going on since the beginning of time, but our special war preparing for Good Friday, 3 p.m. We consider that day to be like the day in which we are judged by Christ, the day of the judgment, the day in which we are either, either going to end up permanently in the kingdom of God for all eternity in the church triumphant, or permanently in the kingdom of hell for all eternity in the damned, amongst the damned. And we'll be members of one of those two kingdoms at the, for all eternity, and we're in the fight. Right now, every single soldier of Christ, the devil is trying to drag them away from the soldiers of Christ and make them soldiers of Satan. And every single soldier of Satan, the, 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 our Lord 
is trying to, through the saints and angels, to bring them back into the kingdom of heaven. And we're now in the middle of the fight. So this isn't day one. It seems as though the fight's going to go on for a long time. Now, we don't know the last day of the fight. We don't know the day of our death. We don't know the day of our judgment. It might be this very day for some of us. But we know that we're in the middle of a fight. And it could go on for a long time. And we didn't just begin yesterday. We're in the middle of the fight. So there are certain temptations and certain preparations which Satan is doing in order to make sure that souls will be on his side when the test comes on Good Friday. St. Basil speaks about it. He says, when we first meet Christ, we meet him in the crowd. And the crowd, all the crowd is, it's a gathering of people for various purposes. So you're inside the airport. You're inside the city, and there's one here, and there's one there. One is going shopping, another one is visiting friends, another one is there to go to church, another one is there to commit a crime. All there are for many different reasons, but they just happen to be located in this one place together. And it is in the crowd that we first meet Christ, says St. Basil. It's the crowd. We were just walking by one day, and we met Christ. Everyone begins in the crowd. Some were bad, some were good, some were indifferent. But everyone was just in the crowd. Now, all begin in the crowd. And the crowd is neither good nor bad. But when Good Friday comes, we're going to discover something. There is no crowd present on Good Friday. There are no indifferent souls on Good Friday. On Good Friday, there is a mob. And that mob shall say words very familiar to us. Crucifige, crucifige eum. Tole, tole, crucifige eum. Let him, take him away, take him away, let him be crucified. Let him be crucified. Let his blood be upon us, upon our children. We have no king but Caesar. And they mock him. And they go with great interest from trial to trial to trial to see all the things that they accuse him. Some come out of the crowd to say, this man, he said crazy things when he was teaching. He said he would destroy a temple, the very temple built by Solomon and rebuilt by Esdras, and in only three days he will re rebuild it. And they will contradict each other, and they will say all kinds of wicked things. But we'll notice about those that are the friends of Christ, there will be a devil inside of them. And it will be the same devil that is the one in the gospel today. That there was a man possessed of the devil. Christ cast out millions or hundreds of thousands, thousands and thousands of devils. During his time. This particular day, there was a man that was dumb. That is, he's unable to speak. He's the devil of silence. The devil of silence. That's the one we meet in the middle of the fight. I'm not joining the army of Satan. I'm not saying I'm going to be a modernist. I'm not saying that I'm, in, I'm voting for Obama. And I'm voting for Hillary. I'm not in favor of abortion. I'm not in favor of birth control. I'm not in favor of wickedness. I'm not in favor of Vatican II. I'm not in favor of the new mass. I'm not in favor of what Bishop Pillay is doing, com compromising the society of St. Pius X. I'm not in favor of the city of the Cactus. I'm not in favor of anyone who's standing for the wrong positions. What devil is in them? It's the devil of dumbness. It's a Satan of silence. This Satan is a very powerful Satan, and he's inside the soul in the middle of the fight. St. Basil says, it doesn't happen in a minute. We meet Christ, just another man. Oh, well, maybe he's a miracle worker, maybe he's God. We don't just meet him in a minute and then decide to crucify him in the next minute. There has to be a transformation going on inside of our souls, and that transformation takes time. There has to be a turning to wickedness inside of our souls, and that the wickedness takes time. And the devil is doing it right now. He is doing it to all Catholics. And all Catholics who call themselves conservative. And the ones that call themselves traditional. And now the ones that call themselves part of the resistance. The devil is working inside the soul. The devil of silence. And this devil of silence, what is he going to do? He's going to say, well, I'm, I'm not... I'm not violent like the other devil was, the one in the land of the Gerasenes. I don't have to be tied up. I'm not wicked. And our Lord speaks about this particular devil when he says in the gospel, you know that today is a day when you read the words of Christ. This is a day when the Lord Jesus Christ is in a really bad mood. He is not happy today. He's not happy at all. He just released the devil. And then what do they say? Well, some say that, you know, he casts out devils by the devil. 
Notice that some in the crowd say, he casts out devils by the devil. And others say, I don't think they're right. But they don't say it. They only think it. The devil of silence is in them. They are not like the man born blind. The man born blind is most wonderful. The man born blind, we read out in the Gospel of St. John chapter 9. He was born blind. He was nothing of God. He was unholy. And he was blind in every way. And one day our Lord Jesus Christ cured him of the blindness. And the first day in his life he saw. And it happened to be a Sabbath day. And they asked him, how were you made? How were you able to see? The man Jesus Christ made me able to see. And they said, well, he's not of God. He cured on the Sabbath. And the man born blind said, it is a wonderful thing that you say he's not of God. For from the beginning of time until this very day, no man has ever cured one born blind. How could he be not of God? And the Jews became very angry with him. And they kept asking him. And finally, after asking him three times, the man born blind said, you've asked me so many times, maybe you want to be one of his disciples. Why don't you become one of his disciples? You asked me so many times. And they were angry with him. He was not silent. And when he came, he still wasn't sure of all the facts. And then he came to Jesus Christ and said, Who are you, Lord? You're the one that cured me. He says, I am God. It is God that cured you. It is the Messiah that cured you. And he fell flat on his face and adored him. There were many that were cured. But this man was filled with God. And he saw and he spoke more boldly than the apostles, more boldly than others. He didn't go to catechism class. He didn't see any of the other miracles of Christ because he was never able to see. He knew nothing about him until that very day. He spoke. But then there's the people in the gospel today. They have been following Christ for two years. They have witnessed thousands upon thousands upon thousands of miracles. They have seen people risen from the dead. They have seen lepers cleansed. They have seen devils driven out. They've seen the swine run off the cliff. They have seen this man perform so many miracles that he's truly God. They've heard him preach the same sermon over and over again. They know that he's preaching the kingdom of heaven. They know that he's establishing the kingdom of heaven on earth. They know that he says he's supposed to die on a cross and so on. They know what he says. And what do these devils do? What do these devils do? They make them ask questions. When there are no questions to ask. They make them look for more evidence. When they don't need any more evidence. And they make them be careful. You have to be careful. You're never careful when you go to McDonald's. You're never careful when you order candy. You're never careful when you go to a brothel house. You're never careful when you, you, you make sure that you never, any, anything you touch. Make sure it's not touched by anything else. Except when it's marijuana. Except when you're doing drugs, then you can share. You don't worry about you don't worry about spreading germs. Then, when you are sinning, when you are offending God, when you are vomiting upon Him, you don't have to have good hygiene. But every other time you do, and this is a mockery of God, and this is a blasphemy before God. You say you don't want to be unclean, then why do you live in fornication? Why do you live inside of wickedness? Why do you share drugs with your friends? Why do you live in absolute impurity of mind, impurity of mouth, disgustingness of eyes? All you look at is pornography. All you speak is filth. All you do is vomit with your friends, but you go to Mass on Sunday, and for a moment you look holy. And whenever you're around your friends, you look spiritual, and you dress yourself up to be a half-Catholic. This is what we do in the middle of the battle. We secret our sins are secret, and our goodness is shown before men. And what's one of the signs? Men come and tell lies, and we are silent. The devil of dumbness is inside of us. And what happens? The devil gets into the heart, and he's twisting it, he's corrupting it. Notice on Palm Sunday, only six days before Good Friday, notice that the children, the, all the people praise Christ. Caiaphas is not worried about the adults praising Christ. He sees the magistrates praising Christ. He sees the people praising Christ. He is not worried. Satan is not worried either. And Christ is not impressed. But there is one worry only on that day. Christ weeps on that day. He's not happy that they are going to praise him. The devil is not worried. Why? Because their lips praise him. 
but their hearts are far from them. And Christ knows it, and Satan knows it. And even those people in the crowd, whenever they turn off their TV, whenever they turn off their radio, whenever they turn off the sound coming through their iPad, iPod and so on, they also know there's something wrong in their conscience, and therefore they keep the noise going. Christ is not impressed by all these voices. Only one thing disturbs the devil and Caiaphas on Palm Sunday and impresses Christ, and that is the children. Therefore, Caiaphas and the evil, wicked Pharisees on Palm Sunday say, how dare you let these children praise you? Everyone's praising you. But why are you letting the children praise you? Because their praise is innocent. Their praise is powerful. Their praise is pleasing to God. And therefore, it threatens hell. And it impresses Christ. And therefore, Christ says to them, if these children did not praise me, the very rocks would cry out. He didn't say the adults would cry out. The adults are useless. They're worthless. Because I would that you were hot or cold. But if you're a lukewarm, I will vomit you. Begin to vomit you out of my mouth. This is what we're dealing with. These are the soldiers of Christ in our times. You know that when they get really bad, the day that Bishop Filet signs a deal with Rome, that's the day I'm standing up. The day that Pope Francis says that everybody who's living in a bad marriage can be a good Catholic and stay in their bad marriage. The day when the bishop, that's when I'm going to join tradition. A priest told me 20 years ago, here in Denver, a little more than 20 years ago, the day that they approve of all the girls, that's the day that I'm becoming a traditional Catholic. And then they approved all the girls. Okay, Father, I said, they approved all the girls. He says, you know, they're more reverent than the boys. <laughs> well, he changed his mind. And how many times will they change their minds? Everyone's going to draw the line tomorrow. Why? Why is a devil of silence inside of them? There's a reason for silence. It's called survival. There's a reason for silence. It's recorded also in the Gospel of John, saying, ch chapter 9. For that man born blind was a great man, but his mommy and daddy were wimps. And they came to his mommy and daddy, and they said, how did this man come to see? He said, well, he was born blind, we know. He sees, we also know. How he came to see, he's over 21. Ask him. <laughs> they knew exactly how he came to see. They were witnesses. But they said, he's of age. He's over 21. He can drink. Ask him. He can vote. Ask him. And it tells us in the Gospel of St. John chapter 9, and they said this because they were afraid of being cast out of the synagogue. They were silent. They were silent. The devil of silence is all over the church today. He's everywhere. We're waiting for better times. And notice that our Lord Jesus Christ is still popular. He has not yet been captured. He's still popular. The crowds are following him, and yet they are silent. Why? Because our Lord Jesus Christ is always traveling. He's always on the circuit. He doesn't stay in one place. He goes from one place to the next, to the next, to the next. So when he leaves, those Pharisees are still here. Those Sadducees are still here. And they are, have got the guys with cameras taking pictures of everyone that praises him. And when Christ leaves, they show up at your door. That's what they do. Just like, for instance, in Germany in 1938, I believe it was a year, my, uh, my cousin's my, my dad's brother married a German girl. And her father didn't like Adolf Hitler in 1938. And they, the Nazis had a pilgrimage through their town. And every single house had to have a swastika on the house. Every single house had to praise Hitler when they walked through. He didn't put a swastika in his house. And he refused to praise Hitler when he came through. So what he did was, he took some of his chickens, he took some of his animals... And he gave them to the neighbors. The neighbors then gave him their dead chickens or dying chickens and their worthless pigs to him. And then he stood there. And they went by. And when the pilgrimage was over, the Nazis came to his house. They took his house. They took all his chickens. They took everything that he had and they threw him in prison. And then the neighbors brought back the other chickens and the other cows for his wife and family to survive. 
But he would not praise them. He would not. And when the war began, the first battle, they put him in the front lines. And he said, I'm not fighting for Hitler. And so the first battle came against the French. Fortunately, it was the French. If it was anybody else, he would have been in trouble. <laughs> but it was against the French. And he said, I'm not fighting for Hitler. And the French started shooting at the Germans. The Germans started shooting at the French. He put down his gun and he walked across the no man's land. And the French shot and shot and shot. He didn't duck and they missed him. The German commander said, shoot him, he's a deserter. But they said, this man is too brave and strong. They did not shoot him. And he walked. And eventually the French figured out, this guy is weird. <laughs> they stopped shooting. And he lived. And so the fact is, God will protect those who stand for the truth. Even when no one else does. Remember when Tobias stood for the truth. Tobias stood for the truth, and what happens? He was not put to death. He buried the dead when they could not be buried. Now this devil of silence, why do we follow him? Because we're afraid. Because we believe that when we speak out the truth, we shall be in trouble. This all around us right now. We feel a general fear when we walk the streets. Don't say anything against homosexuality. Don't say anything against the modern wicked laws. You might be noted in the book. Big Brother. If it was Hillary, it would be Big Mother now, but instead it's still Big Brother. <laughs> so Big Brother will watch over you. And Big Brother is going to come after you. That's the way it is. So the devil of silence, he's a very powerful devil. And he's with us right now. Now this dumb man and the devil of silence released from him, and the dumb man spoke. He didn't speak like a football player. Love you, mom. He spoke. And what did he speak? He spoke words that were disturbing to the people. And hence, some in the crowd said, he must cast out devils by Beelzebub. And others said, well, maybe not by Beelzebub, but I need some kind of proof. Just like in our particular battle of the resistance, they keep asking us for proof. Prove to me that Bishop Fillet, on the negative side, is a liberal modernist. Well, he said the new master will be promulgated. Did you ask him what he meant by that? Maybe he didn't mean what he said. Mm. Prove to me that the society is going to will never go towards Rome with Pope Francis. The society will never, never, never go towards Rome with Pope Francis. He's so liberal. Now that Pope Benedict is gone. Well, Pope Francis is a good man. Pope Francis loves everybody. He doesn't think about principles, says Bishop Pelay, but he's a man that loves us. He's been so good to us. I got people that told me he's good to us. In 2012, Bishop Pelay said, I got people that told me that Benedict is going to do the right thing. Maybe it's the same people. They lied then. I wonder if they're lying now. Are the liars still lying? Maybe they are. Why are you believing the lie? It's because you want to believe it. It's because we don't want the consequences of not believing it. And so, they continue to preach modernism. They continue to make excuses, like the excuses for Amoris Letizia. Say, Amoris Letizia is not very good, says the Society of St. Pius X. It's disturbing, it's conserving, but he hasn't crossed the line. What line is that? Fire is very vibrant. It doesn't have lines. It just burns. Christ has a line. And when you step across the line into a lie, you are across the line. And you shall be burnt. And he crossed the line a long time ago. Pope Francis did. And he preaches error and heresy. And he is leading souls to hell by those errors. And it doesn't benefit souls to be silent about it. It doesn't benefit souls to make excuses for it. It doesn't benefit souls to say the words of the parents of the man born blind. He's of age. Ask him. I wasn't there. It does not help souls at all. What happens with this devil of silence? He gets inside the soul. He eats it alive. And we look holy. And we look pious. Like, the, like they say so often about the serial killers. That very often the serial killers are gentle. They're understanding. They're quiet. And then one day they explode in violence. And that's the way it will be on Good Friday. All those gentle people, all the good ones, all the ones who are on the side of righteousness, the conservatives and the Catholics, they will blurt out, let him be crucified to the followers of Christ. They will blurt out, let his blood be upon us, upon our children. 
They will blurt out, we have no king, not Christ, we reject him. We have no king but Caesar. That's what they will say. As they said 2,000 years ago, and will continue to say until the end of time, man has not changed, sin has not changed, wickedness has not changed, and he who is God never changes. God is, and the devil is not. God is goodness, God is truth, God is justice. And on this day, our Lord says, now consider the man. All of you left sin, you all got baptized, all of you follow me in the desert, all of you believe in my miracles, all of you say that I am the Son of God. And so you have been made clean, because I have cast the devil out of you. But let me tell you a story about such a one. And so he says in the gospel today, there was a man who had the devil cast out of him. And that devil went for a place to rest. He couldn't find one. Couldn't find a parking place. He couldn't find one. So what did he do? He came back to the place where he was, and he found it mundatum et ornatum. He found it cleaned. He found it garnished. He found it empty. That's the way he found it. Why didn't he park there? Because he knew there was no danger of God ever entering such a place. You notice this sterility in the modern architecture, the modern churches, even the so-called conservative ones, these new churches they're building, they build them in a kind of a style that's like the old days. But it's cold and empty. It's mundatum et ornatum. It's clean and empty. Yes, it's got an older style, kind of, but it's clean and empty. Christ is not there. It's an empty shell. And they have a Latin Mass sometimes. They have a new Mass other times. St. Isidore's has become such a place now. We we'll always pray that it falls down before they have their first new Mass there. We put a special little thing in the stone so that well, before they say the first new Mass there, it's collapse. <laughs> but nonetheless... It's changed. Mundatam ornatam. It's clean. It's vague. It's garnished. It's empty. And many souls, when they walk into these churches, they report everywhere in the world, I can feel the emptiness. Will Christ enter? No, He will not. There is no danger of Him showing up anytime soon. And hence the devil leaves that house. Whether it be the house of a church that has gone away from the truth, like St. Isidore's, or whether it be the house of a soul that has walked away from the truth, like the traditional Catholics who used to follow our tradition of the faith. There's no danger of them coming back to the truth. Don't worry. As Father, as Father uh, Jahir told us, the old 70-year-old priest in Brazil, back in 2013, he told Father Hugo and myself, he says, those who receive the grace and they don't accept it, they will never change. They will never change. Of course, there's always a miraculous thing that can happen to one soul here or there. But for the vast majority of them, they will always be conservative and they will never be Catholic. This is the way it is. At some point, we have to go to Christ. At some point, we have to follow our ancestors. Each of them had to, be, had to sacrifice their lives in order to stand for the truth. And they spoke out. And their speaking out got them in trouble. Emerenciana, who's here inside of this, or she's in the altar that I say Mass on almost every day. Especially when traveling with our Mass kit. She only is a martyr because she couldn't keep her mouth shut. If she was silent, she would not be in this altar. But in the year 302, year, 302 AD, this 13-year-old girl, who was not yet baptized, she saw Roman boys curse the Catholic Church. She saw Roman boys rejoice over the death of Agnes, whom they had killed the week before. And she said, she spoke out, You do not curse the true Church of Christ. And Agnes is with God. And she blasted them. And so they stoned her to death. And she is a martyr and a saint. And so it is with all the saints. They must speak the truth 
They must not succumb to the devil of dumbness. And who is required to be a saint? All of us. You are required to be saints. And I am required to be saint. And all of us are required to be saint. It is not an option. It is not a request. Which to our Lord Jesus Christ says, you always go back to that man. He had the devil cast out. He went to confession. He got baptized. He entered the church. But he never filled himself with Christ. He never custodied Aeon of the faith. We say in the last verse of the last verse of the gospel today says, who, 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 Blessed is he who, who, who hears the word of God and keeps it, we say in English. But in Latin it says custodit, which means guard. And like the word keep used to mean, remember a keep is a tower. A keep is a tower in which you store your, your uh, food and which you store your weapons and you store your ammunition. And you protect the keep. And when the enemy comes to the keep, you pull out your arrows and you shoot them. You pull out your boiling oil and you dump it on them. And you preserve your food inside of the keep. And that's what it means to keep. To keep does not mean to put in storage at the you store it place. That's what keep means now. I've got the faith. It's, on, it's over there on I-70, just on the you store it place on the way to St. Isidore's in Commerce City. He used to drive the place all the time. I got it right there. It's in room 10, right behind the couch. There it is, the faith. It's got, three or four, it's got three or four bolts on the door. It's got bulletproof door. Nobody can seal it. It's got camera protection in it. i got my faith in safe storage. That is not keep. Keep means keep your eye on it. Keep means guard. Keep means protect. Keep means embellish. Keep means strengthen. Keep means worry. Worry. Lest someone come and take it in the night. Our Lord said Worry. Work out your salvation in fear and trembling because the devil's working out your damnation. He's working on the soul right now in the middle of the fight. We don't choose to follow Christ on Good Friday. We don't choose to be Nicodemus. We don't choose to be a, a St. Dismas of the cross. We don't choose to be on the, on the, on next to Our Lady. We make none of those choices on Good Friday. They are made before. They are made before. And if we don't make those choices now, when Good Friday comes in our life, when Pilate says, these people have to be crucified, I'm sorry, I don't want to do it, but I have to do it, I've got no choice. When Annas and Caiaphas come before us, and when all the wicked souls are surround us, we will find they're not that bad after all. We will find that we're friends with them. We will find that we will curse the just. And then when they die, because we're good people, what happened at 3 p.m. on Good Friday? All those people that mocked Christ, they struck their breasts. Oh boy, so sorry that he had to die. And I got to get back home for dinner. <laughs> I'm so sorry. And so they struck their breasts at the earthquake. And they wept. And they went home for dinner. And they forgot about it. This is the way it is. That's why our Lord says in the gospel today, that man got seven devils more wicked than the first, plus the first devil, which is eight devils. Eight means perfection. And the last state of that man was worse than the first. So it is the priest. What shall the salt be salted with if it loses its savor? What happens when a priest turns bad? How do you turn him good again? How do you do it? You are the salt of the world, says Christ. Firstly to the priest, but secondly to all the Catholics. And when salt loses its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? Eight devils are going to come and dwell there, and the state will be worse than the first. And this is what's happening right now to souls everywhere in the world. Now, the, what must happen with our faith? It must be spoken. When must it be spoken? Always. Where must it be spoken? Everywhere. Makes it simple. What are we supposed to be doing St. Paul told us in Romans chapter 10, Fides ex auditu, faith comes by hearing. But how can a man hear unless there be preachers? And how can a man preach unless he be sent? Therefore the devil has been trying to stop preachers for the last 2,000 years. And hence he wants silence. He doesn't need just men to be wicked. He only needs them to be silent. There are plenty of volunteers to be wicked. He's got enough of those. But he needs the just men to be silent. He needs them to follow the silence of the dumb. The dumb the devil. The dumb devil. 
And when they do, their hearts change. Their hearts change. This is a great wickedness that is before us. And we find ourselves making platitudes. Platitudes. So here, the... Um, We have here the, the example of these platitudes. What is happening in our church? The bishops and the priests who are supposed to be teaching us the word of God are giving cheap moral platitudes. That's what Bishop, William, Bishop Sheen said what happened 50 years ago. He said, if you have Christ without the cross, what do you have? An effeminate Christ that stands for nothing. And what kind of priest is that? On his good day, he's one that preaches cheap moral platitudes. And on his bad day, he's a faggot. And we have the whole church filled with homosexuals right now. How did it happen? It didn't happen by accident. <coughs> That's what happens when you take Christ off the cross. And the priest is another Christ. <coughs> if he decides to leave his cross, he decides to be effeminate. He begins by cheap moral platitudes. And then what happens? He becomes a fruitcake. And that is where the world is today. <coughs> that is where it is. And so this <coughs> is a version of the devil of silence. Just today, yesterday, Bishop Williamson and other Eliasson comments, you know, many people don't read them anymore. <coughs> One of our faithful taking me to the airport today in Minneapolis. I think the one today, Father, was a good one. I said, you know, he did a bad one last week. He's talking about what was the crisis of authority in the church. And we're going to solve the crisis of authority by consecrating a fourth bishop. Then it'll be a fifth and a sixth and a seventh and an eighth and a ninth and a tenth. But this will be a fourth bishop to keep the bishops rolling. When the bishop of North America, bishops in Deos, will be consecrated a bishop on May 11th of North America. And he says the crisis is not a crisis of faith, but a crisis of authority, which of course is completely false. We're in a crisis of faith, not a crisis of authority. We don't need another bishop who's not going to confirm our children. We don't need another bishop who's not going to preach the Catholic faith. We don't need another bishop who's not going to, we are now not going to ordain. We already have now more bishops ordained through Bishop Williamson than we have priests ordained. And as we see the hallmark among the city of the Contents, they have more consecrated bishops more than they are ordained priests. And so now we find the same thing here. What's, what is it going to do? Create a mockery of the resistance. And is it an accidental? No, it's not. Is it an accident? No, it's not. To create a mockery. And we are here standing for the truth. And we must continue to stand for it. <clears throat> but here again, <clears throat> a man, a young man writes to the bishop, what are we going to do? When God commands the heaviest storms grow calm, when God protects the worst men cannot harm. Another young man writes to me about the problem of living as a Catholic in today's world around us. But what Catholic cannot have a problem in today's world? His questions as to the world and the church are in italics. And some advice from the author of these comments follows. The, uh, so the, the man, it is more and more difficult for me to live a life consistent with the Catholic faith as far as the world. Should I be thinking as soon as I earn my own living of moving to another country, for example France, in order to seek there the means of founding a Christian family, wife, Catholic priest, consistent with the defense of tradition, and so on. As for Mass, the traditional Mass nearest to my city is in B, where there is a chapel of the New Society and another chapel which depends upon the New Church. What would Your Excellency recommend me to do? I know of no priests in the resistance in my country, nor even of many true Catholics, as it seems to me. In response to the bishop, As for the world, bold, I would not recommend your moving to any other country. Back to regular. There is a very, every likelihood that you would meet there with the same problems, and you would have severed your native roots in your own country. <clears throat> bold again. You may think those roots... And the modern city are not worth much, but they are better than none. Back to regular. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. You would risk jumping from the frying pan into the fire. And instead of jumping from the frying pan into the kitchen table, 
Providence has put you in the city where you have now your family and your friends. The solutions today, bold, the solutions today are rather internal than external. Back to regular text. About all, when world war, and above all, when world war may start before long, the whole USA system is against Trump and it wants war. Similarly, with attending mass. The other chapel that you mentioned was once better than it is now, the other new church chapel. Likewise, the SSPX, as you know, the apostasy today is all around. I would beware of geographical solutions. You could attach one day to the best seeming priest, and a little while later, he goes crazy too. That has happened all too often in the today's church. Bold again, the solution has to be internal <clears throat> rather than external. As for the internal solution, since you read the Elias and comments, when you know how often and repeatedly I recommend praying the full 15 missions of the rosary every day, bold again, good books and good music can also help considerably to nourish and protect the mind and the heart. Read what genuinely interests you. And do not read merely dutiful books, because you will not get out of them nearly as much. End of bowl. Almighty God has, been, has seen from eternity what a mess the modern world would get up to, would get itself into. He has also seen from eternity that there would be souls today still wanting to go to heaven. Is it imaginable that even in today's infernal big cities, he would have left such souls with no recourse, if only they wanted to stay on track for heaven. He foresaw that everything external <clears throat> would fall under the control of his enemies. Telephone calls, emails, drones, universities, politics, law, medicine, etc., etc. That is why I think that what he means by allowing such power to his enemies is to drive us back to him. And to be a true inner practice, to a true inner practice of his holy religion, despite the worst pope that popes and priests can do. Bold again. Therefore, in my opinion, says Bishop Williamson, be content to attend the least contaminated Tridentine Mass that there is anywhere near you. Back, uh, back to unbold. Get regularly to confession with any priest still willing to hear confessions. And who does not tell you that a sin is not a sin? And find the way to work into your day all fifteen mysteries of the rosary, and then possess your soul in patience, and quietly beg God to show you the way to heaven, and to intervene here below before everything is lost. Despite all appearances, he is still in perfect control. Kyrie eleison. This is an example of cheap moral platitudes. Not for the edification of souls, but for the destruction of souls. <clears throat> what is the essential message? Well, first of all, it's very important. You can read this in the paper tomorrow. I forget what section it's in. It's called the horoscopes. <laughs> you can read the palm reader section. You can go to the horoscope or the, crystal, the lady with the crystal ball. And she will tell you, what should I do? Read good books. <laughs> And read and listen to good music. If you live here, at this place, it must be wholesome hip-hop. <laughs> read good books and listen to good music. Can also help <clears throat> considerably to nourish and protect the mind and the heart. This could also be on the early morning news in, in USA Today, the Today Show. And, uh, maybe, uh, the doctors say that you should... Uh, oh, we would considerably nourish the mind and nourish the heart. Read with genuinely what genuinely interests you. I'm interested in the serial killers. What are you interested in? <laughs> read in what genuinely interests you. And do not read merely dutiful books. I'm interested in Kentucky winning the national championship. We are now in March Madness. <laughs> so, but either, Kentucky is not what it used to be, but it's still Kentucky. Better well, here we can pray for, for Gonzaga because you know the, what's his name, Mr. Perkins, the owner of the place. Here, his son, his son is on the Gonzaga team, and Gonzaga, Gonzaga is uh, still advancing. 
and they're and they're a good team, except for the religion is bad, it's the Jesuit, <laughs> but they have a great team, and uh, and so that and, and his son is a starter on the team, so we wish him well in the tournament. You know, so we'll go Gonzaga. So let's read about Gonzaga University basketball. <laughs> let's read about Kentucky basketball. Read what genuinely interests you. And do not read merely dutiful books like the Catechism, <laughs> Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, stuff like that. And do not read merely dutiful books because you will not get out of them nearly as much. So serial killers, basketball, hip-hop, wholesome hip-hop, of course, none of that modern bad stuff. Now, this kind of statement can mean anything. These are the statements of the pagan priests. Like the example we mentioned many times of the pagan priest who stood with Maxentius in the year 312 at the Battle of Milvian Bridge. When there was a large army of Maxentius and a small army of an upstart named Constantine on the other side of the river. And Maxentius said to the pagan priest, What do the gods say? Who is going to win the battle? And Maxentius, the pagan priest, said, I have spoken with the gods, and they have said, Tomorrow the enemy of Rome will fall. Now Constantine, he's a Roman. Maxentius, uh, he's a Roman. <laughs> and a Roman is fighting a Roman. Probably one of them is going to lose. <laughs> and the other one is going to probably win. And he's going to be a Roman. It's a pretty good guess. <laughs> And so he said, the enemy of Rome will fall. Well, Constantine won the battle. He took the pagan priest and he was going to kill him. And he said, you can't kill me. Well, why not? Because I prophesied yesterday the enemy of Rome would fall. And he did. And so Constantine couldn't kill him. He lived. What kind of prophecy is that? Where it can mean anything to anyone... Depends on where you come from. This is called a cheap moral platitude. It causes harm to souls. It placates souls. It does not communicate the truth. And now we come to the practical conclusion. Therefore, in my opinion, by the way, what I read was in bold. Therefore, again in bold, in my opinion, be content to attend the least contaminated Tridentine Mass that there is anywhere near you. Don't stand for the truth. Don't stand for the faith. And it really sounds kind of nice. These are very dangerous words. To say something that sounds kind of nice, but it doesn't mean nice. It doesn't mean good. It confuses souls and leads them away from God. You can interpret it however you want. Who is the enemy of Rome? Well, that's for you to decide. Hmm. What is the friend of Rome? Well, that's for you to decide. What is going to nourish your soul? That's for you to decide. You see, you could be a great psychiatrist and a great psychologist and a great pagan priest if you just know how to scratch the right egos. Hmm. That's what you're supposed to do. But then there's the priest of God who is a follower of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is supposed to preach the word of Christ. He is supposed to preach the divine truth. And when our Lord Jesus Christ was standing there this day, He said, all right, all you people say you're following me. Behold, many of you shall have eight devils. Whereas when I met you, you had only one. And on the day of the test, you shall fail. And you shall call upon the help of God. And it's recorded in the book of wisdom. In the book of wisdom it says, and they shall call upon me. And I shall not hear. They shall call upon the Lord, and he shall turn his face away. You ever heard of the boy that cried wolf? It was a bad day for him. And so it will be for many souls. I call on the Lord. When the Lord was there, you were silent. When the enemies were attacking him, you were silent. And when you could have spread his kingdom, you did not. You kept the house of your soul clean and empty. You didn't fill it with the divine truth. You filled it with wholesome music like Beethoven. 
You filled it with nice books, like like uh, the uh, Jeffrey Chaucer and, uh, Ch- and uh, not not Charles Darwin. He's not wholesome. Dickens, the other idiot. <laughs> You filled yourself with all kinds of interesting things that were so valuable to you and meaningful to you. And of course you could turn it to something wonderful. The man born blind knew more in his first five minutes of the church than these wise old men. We are in a great war. It's going on right now. When the battle, when the cannons start firing, the war is already over. When the cannons start firing, the fight is already over. It's the final desperation of Satan when he pulls out his cannons. He will know that he is defeated, and he's right. He shall be defeated. This is the time of the fight. Who is going to stand in the time of the silent devil? This is what we must do right now. And then our Lord said... Don't be like that man. Because also then he make it very clear. He said there is a man that's strong. He has armor. You have armor. The whole world has armor. You've got a special electronic armor system that controls your house. You've got nerf proof cars that won't get in accidents. Because while you're on your cell phone and calling your girlfriend, your car is paying attention to the traffic. So don't worry. And it will automatically stop. It will automatically go. Now, it might automatically drive you off a cliff one day because someone else who doesn't like you is in control of the computer. It might drive you to the police department one day. If the doors may not open one day, but let's not worry about that because that's tomorrow. Right now, I'm texting my girlfriend. And so, don't worry. Be happy. And what will happen? One day, you will worry. And it will be too late. One day you will call upon the Lord, and it will be too late. And what it says in the book of wisdom is that Christ will be active. In other words, he'll be looking at you, you will call upon him, and then he will stop his ears. You will look at him, and he will turn away. So that it's very clear that he is not listening to your prayer. St. Alphonsus said, the prayer of a sick man is sick. The conversion of a sick man is sick. In other words, when you're sick and dying, and you decide to be sorry for your sins, why are you sorry? Because you're dying. You're not sorry because of your sins, and hence your sorrow is sick. Don't plan on being sorry the day the bombs are dropping. Don't plan on reaching for your rosary the day the bombs drop. Now here also, Bishop Williamson does say a good thing. Pray your rosary. That's very good. Internal solution. Not external ones. Don't move. Don't do anything extraordinary. That's the teaching of the modernists. No one is obliged to the extraordinary. We know as Catholics that if today, right now, though we're not ready, I'm not ready, you're not ready, but if right now a man comes in here and says, you shall spit on a crucifix or I shall skin you alive, we better pray to St. Bartholomew. That's how he died. He was skinned alive. Bartholomew, help us. Where do you want to skin first? And if they come in here and say, you will spit on a crucifix, you will deny Christ, or we will put you to death, or we will throw you in prison, <coughs> what are we obliged to do? We are obliged before God, under pain of eternal damnation, to accept to be skinned alive, to accept to be thrown in prison, rather than to deny Christ. But what does the bishop say here? Well, pick the least. He gives you seven blasphemous formulas. Pick the one that's the least blasphemous. You've got, to murder, you've got to choose between seven people to murder. Pick the one that probably deserves it. <laughs> and so, the fact is, just take the lesser evil. Take the lesser choice. And this is an abomination before God. He laid down his life for his enemies. He laid down his life (coughs) for his enemies and he called them friends. It was the last word he spoke to Judas. And Judas was his friend until he died. And then when Judas died unrepentant, then Christ said to him, depart from the accursed. But until that moment, he was friend. And he laid down his life for Judas as he did for Peter. Peter would repent and Judas would not. 
He loved his life for others. So likewise, when our persecutors come to us to put us to death or to throw us in prison, we must love them. It's not a list of things to do if you're a nice person. You must love your enemies. You must not hate Obama. You must not hate Hillary. That's always a hard one. But you must not. You must not hate Obama. You must not hate Hillary. You must not hate all the evil men ruling the world today. You must not hate the Rothschilds. You must not hate anyone who is against God. You must not hate them. We must love them. And if they come here, we'll give them a cup of coffee. Maybe some additions inside, but a cup of coffee. (laughs) We'll give them a cup of coffee. We will take care of them. And the fact is, we must imitate Christ. And what does that mean? Custodi eam. We went on too long here, but custodi eam. We must guard the faith. We must keep the faith. We must protect the faith. And we must not fall into the grave sin of silence. We must not. We must not. And it's hard for us. It's hard for us. But it's not so hard. Because if we knew the glory and the happiness and the joy and the peace that comes from standing up for Christ in the great battle, if it is not our time, they shall not touch a hair of our heads. That's what Christ said. They will not. And many men I say unto you, they shall not touch a hair of your head. Like my cousin's father, walking across the battlefield, and the French were shooting at him, and shooting at him. They couldn't hit. They couldn't hit. Because it was not the time chosen by God. He chooses the moment of our death. He chooses the moment of our our going into eternity. And if we remain faithful to Him, it shall be a beautiful and happy and wonderful moment. Neither too soon nor too late, but at the most perfect time. And all that is necessary for us is to not fall to the sin of silence, not let our souls be clean and vanquished, but let them be filled and guarded with Christ, stand firmly for this holy truth, love our Holy Mother, love our Holy Mother. And finally, we finish with her from the miracle of yesterday. Yesterday is one of the beautiful Saturdays in Lent, which you consider Rebecca, who was a symbol of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and Jacob and Esau. On that day, Jacob would receive his greatest blessings. On that day, Esau would go hunting. And Esau had confidence in himself, and he was a great hunter. He hunted for many years. That's the way he prepared for battle. And one day, Isaac said to him, All right, you're a great hunter. Go out and hunt. Go and kill me some venison. Bring it back. (coughs) Said the blind Isaac to his son Esau. And I will bless you this very day. And he went hunting. Jacob was fair of skin, and not hairy like his brother. Jacob didn't know how to hunt. He was a wheeler dealer. He knew how to sell porridge for a bowl of uh, for for a birthright. Get a birthright for a bowl of porridge. He knew how to get a deal. He didn't leave his mommy's side. He just stayed next to his mommy. He just loved his mommy. That's all he did. I Esau was very busy that day, and, and Rebecca was standing by the wall, and she heard Isaac speak, and then she said, "All right, Jacob, you must receive the blessing." Go and kill a couple of goats. Bring them here. I will prepare them. So Esau had to learn how to be a chef. And he was a good chef. But it didn't compare to a mommy. And he cooked up a great bit. How much cooking did Jacob do? Nothing. And then she cooked the dinner. She prepared the, 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 the goat skin. And made it like the son Esau. Hairy skin. And put it upon him. She told him what words to say. She gave him the food. She put perfume upon his body so that he smelled like the great fields. And then she said, now go in, my son, and have confidence. And Jacob was afraid. He wasn't brave either. But he had one wise thing that he did. He stayed close to his mother. And this is how we prepare for the fight that's next to us. One day we're going to be told, get in there. It's time for you to go in and say, I am your son Esau. It's time for you to go in there and get the blessing. Are we going to be able to do it? Only if we are close to her. Rebecca, the type of the Blessed Virgin Mary, that we say in the marriage blessing, may you young girls who get married, may you have the wisdom of Rebecca. What was her wisdom? What made her so wise? She was like the Blessed Virgin Mary. Read about her yesterday on the beautiful epistle yesterday of the Saturday of the second Sunday, of, after the second Sunday of Lent. So we must be close to her and she'll prepare us for battle. And when it's time, she says, go. And on that day, she said, Jacob, get in there. Speak to your father Isaac, and you shall be blessed. 
Now Jacob, Esau is going to kill you. Get out of here. <laughs> Get lost. Go to your Uncle Laban. And he listened to Mary, and he went to his Uncle Laban, and he wasn't killed that day. He listened to his mother, and he went to Isaac, and he wasn't killed that day. Not only that, he received the most wonderful blessing, but she did the cooking. She did the preparation. And so it is with us. We must fight. We must run to our uncle's house. We will sleep tired and afraid, like Jacob did that day. He was afraid that night. He was exhausted in fear, and he fell asleep. And he put his head upon a rock in a place called Bethel. And later Christ would be born there. And he put his head on a rock, and he had a dream, and he saw angels going up to heaven. And angels coming down to heaven on a ladder. And Jacob would be the means by which the angels would go up to heaven and down. And so it is with us. And Jacob would no longer be a coward. He would become so stubborn, he would become so brave, that his name would be changed. To Israel. Remember another day in Jacob's life. He met an angel. And he talked to the angel all day. And he said what's your name? And the angel said I'm not telling you. He said you're not leaving without telling me. And he fought the angel all night. The entirety of the night he fought the angel. In the morning the angel said you're pretty tough. What's your name? I'm not telling you. But I'm going to give you a new name. Because I am an angel of God. Therefore you shall no longer be called Jacob. But you shall be called Israel, because you have fought with God. And God demands us to fight with Him. That's what He says. We have to fight with Him. Do not ask because you're nice, but knock on the door of importunity. Knock on that door. So that when St. Teresa of the child Jesus wanted to become St. Teresa, and she wanted to become a nun, and they told her no, she did not say, It's the will of God. <laughs> she did not say that. She said, who can fix the problem? The bishop can't fix it. The pope can. Well, then let's go to Rome. When? Now! That's what she said. And so it is with all the saints. They fought with God. Where did that come from? It came from Jacob. Jacob was a wimp, fair of skin. Until one day his mother said, All right, you're not a wimp anymore. Now it's time for you to get a blessing. Now it's time for you to go to Laban. Now it's time for you to wait 14 years for your girl. And so he waited 14 years for his girl. And God blessed him. And he fought with God. And he became Israel. And our holy church is named after him. We are the true Israel. We must fight with God. We must imitate Jacob. We must be next to Rebecca. And if we are, we prepare well for the fight. She is the mediatrix of all grace, that holy mother in heaven. And she will make sure we're ready for the fight if we love her, if we stay close to her. And she will make sure that we do not succumb to the devil of silence. Blessed God bless you all in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost. Amen.